So I've written a few things there to remind you of some of the definitions from yesterday. So remember, we're going to focus this week on decision problems. And those are problems with a yes, no answer. And I mentioned you know, every optimization problem can be phrased as, as a bunch of, like a sequence of decision problems. So if you, yeah, you might remember that from yesterday. And a certificate for decision problem is something which proves that the answer is yes or no, right? So if you have, a, um, if you have an example of an input where the answer is yes, then a, uh, the certificate is something which proves that it's yes. So if the question, for example, in the problem is, you know, is there a, a flow? Remember, we did flows last week, right? So is there a flow of value 100, at least 100? Then a certificate for that would be literally a flow of value 100, right? OK, and MP is the set of all problems such that every yes instance has a polynomial time checkable certificate. And if you change the word yes to no in that sentence, you get a co-MP. So, yeah, so yeah, there's a, there's a sort of asymmetry in this definition of MP that for a yes instance, you must have a polynomial time checkable certificate, but you don't have to have one for a no instance. OK, yeah, and you might remember at the end, I, uh, I finished by giving you a kind of rough definition of what an MP hard problem is. But uh, so today, I'm going to start with a, a more formal, proper definition. So for this, we it's useful to talk about a concept in, well, computational complexity called reductions. Okay? We, I, we've actually already seen some sorts of examples of reductions before. So, so the basic idea here in reductions is that you want to, well, maybe I'll give a formal definition. So say that a, a problem A reduces to a problem B. OK, and every, whenever I say problem this week, I always mean a decision problem, right? So, these are always problems that have a yes or no answer. So problem A reduces to a problem B. OK, sometimes if we're being very careful, we'll say that it reduces in polynomial time. OK, but whenever I say, you know, for the purposes of this week, whenever I say something reduces to something, I always implicitly mean that it reduces in polynomial time, because uh, that's the only sort of reductions we're interested in in this, in this module. So say that A reduces to B if any instance or any, yeah, when I say instance, I mean an input structure for, for problem A, so for A, can be converted to an instance problem B, where the conversion only takes a polynomial time. So in polynomial time, where it's polynomial time with respect to, with respect to, so I'll put this in parentheses. But it should be, it should be clear. I mean, we only have one structure. Originally, we just have one structure, right? It's an in instance for problem A. So, so, so we say, yeah. It reduces if, uh, yeah, you can convert it in polynomial time with respect to the size of the original you know, instance for A. So if, if we can convert it into an instance of B such that the, you know, um, such that, okay, actually, maybe it's, it's useful for me to define some kind of variables. So, well, not variables, but give these things some names. So I'll call the instance for problem A, I'll call it x, OK? So we, want it, so we take an instance for problem A, and we convert it to an instance y of problem B in polynomial time, such that x is a yes instance for problem A if and only if 
y is a yes instance for b. So it has to go both directions, right? If x is a, y, a yes instance, then y has to be a yes instance. And if it's a no instance, then y has to be a no instance for problem b. Any questions about this? Yeah? I suppose you sort of could, but in some sense, if you convert it to multiple instances, then for a single problem B, I mean, it's sort of, if you just now make a different problem B prime, where the input is several instances of B, I mean, it's, it's not really any different, right? So, like in, in some sense, if, if, uh, if you convert it to many different instances of B, now, now make a problem B prime where the input is actually many instances of B, yeah. and it's sort of, yeah. Uh, I mean, this, yeah, that could be the case. I mean, it turns out that they're going to be equivalent, but, but yeah, it's, let's, let's work for the, for the purposes of this. Let's work with, with, this, with this definition, but, but yeah, that's a valid point that um, you could think of multiple instances if you like. It's not going to end up really making much of a difference. Um, yeah, so, okay, so, so what's the kind of, you know, there's two sort of applications of this, this idea of reductions, right? So, so one thing, kind of on the positive side. So, so the way we've seen reductions so far in this module is that basically reductions sort of allow you to reuse algorithms in a certain sense, right? Because if you have now, an, if you have some algorithm to solve B, this gives you a way of reusing that algorithm to solve A. Right? We, we did some sort of things like that. Um, I mean, not, we didn't do any really clever reductions, I think. But for example, like when we were finding the biggest matching in a bipartite graph, we came up with first an algorithm to uh, find an augmenting path. And then we reduced the problem of finding a, the biggest matching to an augmenting path. Right? And even the algorithm for finding an augmenting path used another algorithm for finding a directed path in a, in a, in a graph, in a digraph. So there, there were some sort of reductions that have already happened. And it sort of allows you to reuse these ideas to solve new problems. But there's another clever um, way that you can use them. So it, it allows you to show that that if the problem A is hard, so if A is a hard problem, then B is also going to be hard. OK, and, and I'll formally tell you what hard means in a second. But, but right, because if you, if you can just, if you can take the problem A, any instance for A, and just transform it into an instance to a B, if B was not hard, so if B could, for example, be solved in polynomial time, you'd get that A can be solved in polynomial time. And yeah, and, and therefore, you would get that both of the problems can't be hard, right? OK, so this is how we're going to mainly use um, reductions for this week. So, so now I'll give you a proper definition of MP hard. So a problem B is NP hard if every so problem in NP uh, wait, sorry. Uh, let me just make sure I'm getting this right. Sorry, yeah, every yeah, so I'm going to switch these around just to match up that definition. So a problem A is MP hard uh, if every, wait, can be, I'm just getting confused about definitions right now. Um, well, if every problem can be, yeah. Have I got this the right way around or have I got this backwards? <coughs> yeah, this, uh, right. So this is so. What I'm saying here is that, um, yeah. So if every single problem in MP can be reduced to A, that tells you that if there was an algorithm to solve A, then you could use that to solve any problem in MP. So, and another definition. So a problem A is MP complete if A is MP hard and it happens to also be a problem in MP. Right. 
Uh, okay. Yeah. Oh, I guess I've kind of got the, the. I mean, yeah, I've kind of just swapped the the the, le the names A and B of the problems. Yeah, I tried not to do that, but I kind of messed that up. I mean, but it does. I mean, the A and B are just the name of the problem, right? It's not. Uh, there's no real difference between problem A and problem B. I mean, I could I could completely write this as a problem B is NP complete, NP hard if every A in NP can be reduced to B. Right? It, yeah, that's probably how I should have written it. And then let's say that B is NP complete. So sorry for the confusion here, but if it's NP hard and it's in NP. Okay. I understand these definitions are, are quite confusing, but also one thing I want to say is it's, it's also quite unlikely on your exam that I'm going to ask for any really deep questions about this. You know, this, it, it's a hard topic and it's not really the, the main focus of the module, but the things that you should know are the definitions for sure, right? You should know what NP is, you should know what decision, decision problems are, what NP complete is. You know, these basic definitions are things you should know and, and also what they really, what they mean, but, uh, but yeah. The main focus of the, of the module is actually on proving that algorithms exist rather than proving that things are hard. But uh, OK. So now, yeah, so <clears throat> OK, so now we're gonna, I'm going to show you the first, actually the first ever known example of an MP complete problem. Right? So I give you this definition of MP complete. It's really, I mean, actually, I think if you've seen this, seen this for the first time, it's perhaps surprising that there even exists an NP complete problem. Like, why should there be any problem which is where if you can solve that problem, you can solve every single problem in NP? I mean, it's really weird that that exists, um, but it does exist. So, so now I'm going to define something called the, well, first I'll define Boolean expressions. So, So for those of you who have, might have heard of the SAT problem, satisfiability problem, that's what I'm going to, that's the first example. So I'll, that's what I'm going to define now. Um, so, so, okay, a Boolean expression is just going to be um, an expression uh, composed of, of variables. Okay, where the variables are, um, you know, so the variables are always thought of as, as having value either zero or one. Um, so operations, okay, so this one is going to mean, well, let's say, and, which is written like this, or, which is written like this, and not, which is written like this with, so and, some parentheses. Okay. Now, let me explain what these and, or, and not operators do. So, yeah, so if you take, if you take, let's say, so x and y, let's say are variables, so or they're elements of 0, 1. So if I write x, so if you think, think of 0 and 1 as false and true, Right. So if I write x and y, well, if you have two statements, for example, you know, statement one and statement two, it, if you say, if you put an and between them that evaluates to one or to true, if both statements are true, right? So this is, so x and y is one if x equals one, y equals one, and zero otherwise, right? The or operation, well, you know, if I, if I have two statements and you, you write or between them, you know, it's true if and only if at least one of them is true. So it's one if x is one or y is one and zero otherwise, right? And the not, so the not operator just acts on one statement or one thing. And this is zero if x equals one. 1 if x equals 0, right? So it, it just negates 
the, the, the statement. Okay. So a Boolean expression, for example. Okay, so I've written, so I've been, uh, this is perhaps a little bit imprecise because I've just said, okay, it's just any way of writing down these symbols, but it has to have some kind of, I mean, this is not a Boolean expression if I just write parenthesis, parenthesis or something, right? It has to have, it has to, to be a mathematical expression, and, I mean, but okay, let me, let me give you an example. So, so I can write x1 or x2 maybe, and not x1 or x2 or not x3, and perhaps I write now um, or not x1 and x3. Right, so this is, would be an example of a Boolean expression. Okay. Any questions about this? It's kind of weird, but uh, but this is how how you you find the SAT problem. Yep. Well, yeah, that's that's the good thing about parentheses. So if you put parentheses properly, then then there probably isn't going to be any a ambiguity. Like in some sense, you you kind of go from the inner things outwards. So, if, but you mean if I was to write x1 and x2 or x3 or something? Is that that's the sort of thing you're? Um, in this case, I think it's not very ambiguous because ah, this one, this one is is okay. Yeah, this this one's more ambiguous because I have an and and an or kind of mixed. This one, you yeah, you can put the parentheses any way you like. Uh -huh. uh, I mean, basically, if you take the kind of innermost parentheses, there's only going to be one way to evaluate it. I mean, uh, this whole expression together, yeah. With ah, with an and and an or. Okay, I meant to put an and here. Okay, yeah. Thank, thanks, thanks. Yeah, apologies for that. I definitely meant to put an and there. Yeah, that was definitely ambiguous. It was sort of of this form, right? Thank, thanks for, for for sorting that out. Yeah, good. Right. I mean, I could I could put the the or here, but perhaps I should make it more clear to do this. Yeah. Thanks. Very good. Okay. Right. So now the uh, Boolean status. So the, the satisfiability problem sat. So shorthand for this problem is just to say sat uh, is as follows. So the input is simply some sort of Boolean expression. So. Let's say, let's give the variables names. So in variables, let's say x1 up to xn. And the question, remember it's a decision problem, it's a yes-no question. Does there exist um, a choice of The variables x1 to xn such that the expression outputs true or or one. So such that the expression outputs when you kind of go through it all and evaluate all the way down to the end, it uh, it outputs to one. So what I mean is, you know, you choose each of these variables either to be 0 or 1. You then go through the operations and calculate what the answer is. And if it equals, if there's a way of choosing it such that it equals 1, then the answer is yes. So you want to find, is there some way of doing it? Now, one thing I want to note, so, so a lot of times, like, okay, a lot of the time we've been working with problems to do with graphs and things like that, where the kind of input size of the problem is usually kind of clear, right? It's maybe the number of vertices or edges or something in the graph. Um, here it's maybe not so obvious, so I just want to, to mention, so note, the size of the input, the input is, in some sense, it's the length of the expression, okay? If you want to be really technical, it's the length of the expression if you were to write it in Boolean. But let, let me just say it's the length of the expression. And in particular, it's not. So sometimes 
you know, we have problems in n is the size of the input, but it's not, it's not n. It's not the, the number of variables. It's really the length of the expression, which is the input size. Okay. That's important to, to remember. I mean, it's OK. It's not going to come up. It's probably not going to make or break anything that we do. But, but you could get, get confused if you don't remember this. Okay. Any questions about the SAT problem? It's going away. Come on. Oh, maybe the button's stuck. Aha, that's better. Okay. So the SAP problem, I mean, this is a, this is kind of a weird problem, I understand. But, and it doesn't, I mean, yeah. It perhaps might feel unnatural to you. But it's actually quite an important problem, at least historically, because this was the first ever problem which was proven to be NP-complete. So this is something called the Cook-Levin theorem. That SAT is NP-complete. OK, and this is not something we're going to prove because this would require us to get really, really technical in terms of a lot of things. Like, what do we need, mean by a problem? What do we mean by an algorithm? You know, it would be, it's not the right thing to do in, in this module. But what we're going to do instead is we're going to assume this. So we kind of keep this as a, this is a black box. This is something we just assume is true. And we're going to use it to prove that other things are also NP complete. Okay? Using this idea of reductions. Okay. So for example, oh yeah, just a couple of notes. I mean, so one thing which is, I think, clear is that, um, you know, first of all, why is SAT in, in NP? So so does anyone have a reason why SAT is in NP? So remember, NP, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, well, so with the way that we've defined NP, you know, really the, uh, so we're defining in terms of, yeah, that there's a certificate that you can check in polynomial time, right? And the certificate would just be, like, if, if you had a Boolean expression, I just gave you values of x1, x2, up to xn, and I tell you this satisfies the, the expression, you could easily check that I wasn't lying, right? You could just plug in the numbers and do the operations, and in polynomial time, you will have determined that, yes, indeed, this does satisfy the, the expression. So, so this is because, you know, so the certificate is just an assignment of the variables, the variables. OK, there's another way of defining the class NP, which is in terms of a so-called non-deterministic algorithm, which might be more related to what, what you're saying there, right? If you, you know, a sort of guessing algorithm. But, uh, but yeah, let's just, let's just speak of everything in terms of certificates. OK, right. So uh, yeah, so I want to now show that something called 3SAT is NP-complete. And that's what we're going to use to prove a bunch of other things are NP-complete. But uh, OK. So now I need some more kind of definitions. So, so a Boolean expression so is in something called conjunctive normal form, so which sometimes we'll abbreviate to CNF. If Basically, if it can be written as a bunch of, um, you know, expression, you know, smaller expressions with parentheses, where each smaller expression is just an OR of a bunch of variables or the negation, and between the expressions you have a bunch of ANDs. But let me 
let me explain what, what I mean, but let me explain that better. So um, if it can be written as, uh, so let's say C1 and C2 up to say CK where each CI is of the form, let's say CI equals, um, I don't know, you know, X, well, sorry. Let me just, a better way to say this is just to say that where each CI is, um, well, consists of variables or their negations. Negation just meaning with a not sign in front of it, separated by the or symbol. Okay. So don't worry, I'll give you an example. But let me just here, this is, uh, so I also want to give names to these things. So something which is so an expression which is simply a variable or its negation, we're going to call a literal. So literals are things like xi or not xi, right? And these expressions, you know, ci, which consists of uh, literals separated by ors, this is going to be called a clause. Yeah? Yeah. Reductions, yeah. In some sense, this one turns out to be NP-hard. So this is not something we want to get in deeply, but essentially, this one turns out to be NP-hard kind of. So when you build up all the formal definitions, SAT turns out to be NP-hard almost just by definition. Basically, if you kind of, if you express what is a problem, you know, <clears throat> what is a problem in NP, basically, now you want to say that any such problem, you can just, if you're clever enough, you can write it as a Boolean expression. So like, if you're, I don't know, trying to find the, uh, I don't know, smallest vertex cover in a graph or something, you could, if you wanted, write a bunch of variables, write this as a, as a Boolean expression, or, sorry, to find a, say, vertex cover of size at most k, okay, and that would turn it into a SAT problem. And basically, you want to show any problem can be turned into a SAT problem, which requires a lot of formal discussion about what problems are. But, but yeah, like I said, we're not going to get into that. But then, yeah, once you have this, now you can just reduce this to, uh, to something else, right? Okay. Okay, so, so for example, something in conjunctive normal form, you know, if you have, say, x1, sorry, so or x2 or x3, so this would be the first clause, or let's say not x1 or x2 or not x3, this is another clause where you know, each of these things, so including the not, this is a literal, and you just have a sequence of these with ands between them. Okay. And a theorem, which is another thing we're not, well, maybe I'll call it a lemma, so this is also not hard to prove, is that every Boolean expression is equivalent to one in conjunctive normal form. In the sense that, like, if you have a satisfying assignment for the first one, they correspond to satisfying assignments for the second one, the one in conjunctive normal form, and, and vice versa. So you can transform any Boolean expression into one of these. And yeah, and in fact, I think the size of this conjunctive normal form is bounded in terms of the size of the other one. Um, Let's not worry about details too much. OK, so, so now for, for an integer k, we define another problem, basically the same as sat, except a, a very restricted version. So k sat is the following problem. So the input is now is a, a Boolean 
expression in conjunctive normal form where every clause involves at most k literals. Let's say, I'll just say has, but sure, hopefully it's clear what I mean. So it's, a, it's a, an or with a, at most k literals in it. And the question again is, um, well, is it satisfiable? Where satisfiable means, is there a choice of the variables which evaluates where it evaluates to one. So in other words, does there exist you know, x1 up to xn such that it evaluates to one? Okay, so this is a special case of sat, right? It's, you're looking at sat, you know, these, uh, these things where you don't have too many things, too many literals in each clause. So for example, this is an example of a, so this could be an instance of 3SAT. It's also an instance of 4SAT, right? Because the way I've defined this, everything has to have at most k, um, at most k literals, okay? Any questions about this definition? You know, all of these things are really weird, right? Okay. Okay, so now I'm going to show you, so the, this will be the first time we'll, we'll actually prove something is NP complete in this module. Okay. So I want to show that 3SAT is NP complete. Okay. So. Okay, so, so what we, okay, first of all, one thing is kind of easy, the fact that, so to be NP complete, you have to be, so you have to be NP hard, and you have to be in NP. But we already know that the SAT problem is in NP, right? And, and, and so this one's in NP for the, the same reason. So, so 3 SAT is in NP because, well, so any satisfying assignment of the variables is a certificate, and it's a certificate that you can check in polynomial time. So that's the, the easiest part, the easier part. Now we want to show that it's MP hard. So to show that it's MP hard, Well, we know that SAT is NP hard, okay, which means that every problem in NP can be reduced to SAT. Okay. So to get that 3 SAT is NP hard, we want to show that SAT can be reduced to 3 SAT. Okay. So I'll kind of draw a diagram in a second. But so we show SAT reduces to 3 SAT meaning we want to show any instance of this problem can be converted to an instance of this problem in polynomial time. And then if you think of it, if you take, so this is, let's say, any MP, any problem in MP, let's say, okay, maybe I'll draw this bigger. But the basic idea is that if you, if you do two reductions, that's the same as doing kind of one reduction, right? So if you take, so this is like any problem in NP, so this reduces to SAT by the theorem. And if you now do a reduction to 3 SAT, this gives you a reduction from here to here, right? If you just, yeah, if I can convert the problem into SAT and I convert, convert any SAT problem into 3 SAT, then I can convert any problem to 3 SAT, just kind of transitivity. Okay, so, so how are we going to transform a SAT problem into 3SAT? And it's actually not a hard thing to do. So basically, we've got, a, we've got a, well, let's assume, 
our instance of sat is in conjunctive normal form because any expression can be converted to conjunct conjunctive normal form. So, so take, a, take an input structure for sat, and let's assume that it's in conjunctive normal form because, OK, so everything can be converted to that anyway. So it's kind of without loss of generality. And so basically, the, the idea is for each clause, so suppose you have a clause which is, let's say, I don't know, Z1 or Z2, let's say up to ZK, where let's say K is at least 4. And each of these Z1 up to ZK are literals. So they're all, they're all in, well, let's say my variables are x1 up to xn. So these are all either, either x1 up to xn or not x1 up to xn. So that's what a clause looks like in this thing. And let's, so if it, if it has size 3, I don't do anything to it. If it has size 3 or 2, I don't need to mess with it because it already, it's already quite small. Um, but if you have something like this, what you do is you just replace it by, so I do z1 up to z k minus 2. Is it k minus 2 or k minus 1? Let me just check. Uh, and then, or u, so this is a new variable. And then you put and u or z k minus 1 or z k. So, so we haven't quite gotten to 3sat yet, but you can see that we've reduced the size of the clause, right? So, the, so this clause now has size k minus 1. This one has size 3. So if you were to repeat this, you get eventually to an instance of 3sat. Now, all I need to do is check that if this thing is satisfiable, then the original, so it's satisfiable if and only if the original is. So yeah, so for each clause like this, I do this. Um, yeah, so suppose that there's a way of choosing the variables such that this thing evaluates to true, if I simply put the same values of the variables here, then so either there was a true in z1 up to zk minus 2, in which case this, no matter what I do with u, it'll evaluate to true. Okay? Well, and in that case, I would just, oh, sorry, this should be not u. Ah, sorry, I messed that up. Yeah. This one should have u. This one should have not u. Right. So if, basically, if there's a true value here, I would simply set u equal to false because you essentially you don't need u to be true here, and that will cause this one to be true. And then vice versa, if there's a if there's a way of assigning the variables here to so that it evaluates to true, then you just evaluate you set the variables the exact same way here and just ignore this extra variable, and you'll get true for the original. Okay, and then you have to think that so if you were to keep doing this kind of replacement, the the length of your expression is not going to get too big, right? It's going to be bounded in a polynomial of the length of the original expression. OK, so sorry that this last bit was a bit fast, but I think we've done the whole proof. So see you tomorrow.